Welcome, everybody, to the next in our series on Aim for Inclusion with OTAP. This is a eight-part series about accessible educational materials, and today we are doing the March 19th, 2024 um, session, and I know you're going to be excited about this one. It's a it's a lot of really creative and valuable information. Um, our facilitator for the entire series is Deborah Fitzgibbons, and she's on with us today, but she uh, sometimes lets me be the moderator for these sessions. So uh, thank you for being here, Deborah, and thank you for pulling this series together. My name is Gail Bowser, and I will be the co-facilitator for today's session. I work as an independent consultant to the Oregon Technology Access Program, which is uh, one of the sponsors of this activity, along with the Oregon AIM cohort. And OTAP is operated by the Oregon Department of Education and housed at Douglas ESD. So you can see that already we have a quite a range of collaborators in this session, and we're really glad that you're with, here with us today. Um, the Oregon AIM cohort, we want to make sure you know, is one of the seven states that was chosen to partner with the National AIM Center to participate in a technical assistance grant. And we've been working for several years now on ways to develop systems that help school districts and teachers and students and families understand what accessible educational materials are and the role that they can play in the successful education of students who have uh, reading or print disabilities. So we... Um, those kind of students might include students with vision, fine motor, or comprehension issues. And certainly AIM is a, a strategy that can be applied across the lifespan. We want you to know before we get going that your contributions really enhance this conversation. You're muted as you enter the session. And what our presenters have asked for today is that you hold your questions um, and if you want to speak them, if you want to unmute yourself, that you hold your questions uh, until they ask for feedback or ask, ask for questions. But you're also welcome to put your questions in the chat box at any time and we will make sure they get addressed as we move forward. We always tell you what our next session will be. And our next session in April is actually going to be me again. Um, I'll be doing a presentation called After the Assessment, Ideas about AIM Classroom Implementation. So we've walked through the process of identifying um, AIM in some of our previous sessions identifying the technology that might be needed to deliver accessible materials, talking about resources and sources of accessible materials. And um, in this, that in the, set, the next time session, in the April session, we'll be talking about how do teachers actually use this stuff in the classroom. But before we get to that, we, whoa, I had a thought. <laughs> I apologize. There was a slide here. There it is. I don't know why it went away. Before we get to that, um, I want to introduce you to our two speakers for today who are going to be talking about um, providing access for every student with accessible educational materials and technologies, and their focus is going to be on teacher-made materials. We have our own Oregon Bruce Alter with us. He is a physical therapist and an AT consultant for the Woodburn and Tiger Tualatin School Districts. And you heard about our partnership with the National AIM Center. So we also have Kelly Suiting with us 
today. Um, she's a technical assistance specialist at that AIM Center, and they're going to be our speakers for today. So I will stop sharing, and I think Kelly's going first. So welcome, Kelly, and thanks for joining us today. Hey, friends. Thanks for having us. We are, Bruce and I have been looking forward to this day since we've been asked so we're glad to be here um, just to get started. So you're here for access for every student with accessible educational materials aim and uh, accessible technology. So let's just get started. Uh, Gail did give us a just a brief introduction, but I just want to give you a little bit of background and why I'm here. I do work for the National Center um, on AIM. and my background, I was a, a classroom teacher. I taught general ed and special education. And uh, then I worked for the, before I came to CAST, I worked at the Patents Project, which is the state um, education agency in Indiana. And my role there was really focusing on students with autism and learning disabilities and, and the integration of um, AIM and assistive technology and universal design for learning. And I am so thrilled and you're so lucky to have Bruce Alter in Oregon. And uh, he's my counterpart. Hey, Bruce, you wanna say a little bit about yourself? I'll talk about myself more when I come on, but I don't wanna take your spotlight, Kelly. I do that too frequently. <laughs> My spotlight. Look at that. I'm going to keep this whole spotlight to myself as long as I can. <laughs> okay, so and our agenda. So as we would do if we were working with students still or with our adult learners, know you knowing what the expectation um, is for this next hour and 15 minutes that, that we have with you. So my role here was really going to set up about the why of access for all of our learners and then the what. So we have that shared understanding of what AIM accessibility truly means when it comes to our content um, that we're giving uh, with our learners. And then we're going to roll it over to Bruce as more of the how to that creating materials. And I, friends, I am so excited to learn from Bruce as well. Um, and I also said, if you read my slide, it says the why for access for all leaners. That's amazing. My <laughs> miss on my first one. <laughs> so you know, we're leaners. I'm leaning on you. We're leaning on each other and we're learners. And I'm all about calling the elephant out of the room. I always will. So, and then we're going to have time for Q&A. But like uh, Gail said, the chat box is open. So feel free to pop those in the chat box. And if I catch them while we're talking, I'll certainly um, stop and make sure that I can get those answered as well. Again, our expectations. You came here knowing what the learning objectives are. And so Bruce and I will definitely cover each one of these, but you'll be leaving with a lot more tools than anything is even listed here. So just for accessibility, I'm going to read what's on our slides. So by the time, uh, once we're done with you, um, you'll we'll have a definition of what it means as an educational tool to be accessible. And then just quickly, we're gonna do a simple test on the keyboard or more, not the switch necessarily, just to check for accessibility accessibility to identify any significant barriers as you as educators may be using, ensuring that students can get to and get through the content. And I'll talk a little bit about what that means. And using the built-in accessibility features on your devices, those are the accessible technologies. And so we'll do that to quickly test how well um, an educational app meets the basic accessibility requirements before you're even considering it to use with your learners or leaners, I'd say. <laughs> Bruce is gonna dive in and talk at creating access materials using Google and Word docs. So depending on what platform you uh, use, it will definitely be super meaningful and relevant to you as well. Our accessibility commitment, friends, we're here talking about AIM and we can't have AIM without accessibility. And that holds true when we're, we're offering our content for you as well. So I'm just going to point out that we use the principles of poor, which is perceiv perceivable, operable, understandable, and robust. So all of our slides have alt text. So if you are an individual who uses um, assistive technology like a screen reader, all of our images have those descriptions. Our slides are not super fancy, friends. Uh, we don't want to be the barrier for you to accessing our content. Our font's readable. Any videos that we have will have captions. Are operable, or we have distinct slides, so it's very consistent. Shorten links. Um, actually, I apologize. Let me put our handout link to these slides into the chat box for you now. I popped those in there. Understandable, a very clear structure 
and consistent format. Anytime we have an image that's on our slides, it has a purpose. So it's not just busy. It's not won't be distracting in a way that we don't talk about it for accessibility. And then robust. We've checked for accessibility. And Bruce and I will show you, uh, talk a little bit about manual testing and using accessibility checkers. So you have the handout in the um, chat box. So the goal, um, I'm so excited to be with Oregon because I, ever since I've came to CAS, many people are always talking about Oregon. They're talking about our state co cohorts. And before this started, uh, talking with Deb about the work that they're doing and sharing with so many other states is really filtering out on this large capacity. So um, Oregon should be super proud of the work that they're doing and going to continue to do. And, and I love um, being able to elevate them and their work as they continue. They have a really cool resources that I'm sure you've all heard about, but maybe we'll talk more about that at the end. So we build capacity of the states and districts to support the use of high quality AIM and accessible technologies in a timely manner for all learners who need them. So like Gail mentioned at the beginning, Oregon was one of our state cohorts where um, they received really intensive uh, technical assistance regarding AIM. So just listing here, we have an, uh, a map of the United States. And just to point out, we had Georgia, Missouri, New Hampshire, North Carolina, Oklahoma, Oregon, and West Virginia. So they've been working really hard the past four years, um, not only alone, but together. We're better together, friends. We're better together. And so um, I just want to give a shout out to each one of those states for the work and the continued work um, that they're doing. I always show this video, but so if you've seen me present, you've seen me do this video, but I think this is perfect for um, what we're going to talk about creating a material. So pop in the chat if you've ever felt like. Here's my great grandfather. He's the first cat herder in our family. Herding cats. Don't let anybody tell you it's easy. Anybody can herd cattle. Holding together 10,000 half wild short hairs. Well, that's another thing altogether. Being a cat herder is probably about the toughest thing I think I've ever done. I got this one this morning, right here. And if you look at his face, it's it just ripped to shreds, you know? You see the movies, yeah. you hear the stories, it's. I'm living a dream. Not everyone can do what we do. I wouldn't do nothing else. It ain't an easy job, but when you bring a herd into town and you ain't lost a one of them, ain't a feeling like it in the world. Have any of you felt like that, even with adult learners? You're trying to get everyone to the same goal. Everyone has different needs. And when we think about accessibility, when our content's not accessible, we're constantly pulling students here, reading everything for our students, doing this and all of these different pieces. And when we think about that, when it comes to accessibility, which we're getting ready to dive into, when students can have access and participate in their own learning, they are better in being able to get to the goal uh, more independently. So we're not kind of pulling everyone. We are prepared and thinking of any student that comes into our environment. So after this, we're gonna hope that it doesn't really feel like hurting. It just feels like giving in the path and you're facilitating and they're all getting there to the same goal. And I'm really excited again about uh, you doing that for us, Bruce. So access for every learner. So these are really, so the four things when I think about access for true access for every learner, Universal design for learning, the principles of universal design for learning, really thinking about uh, before any of our students that come into our environment, we're prepared. And with that, I see that as the umbrella and with accessibility and then aim accessible educational materials, our content being accessible so our students can engage and participate in their own learning with the use of assistive technology or accessible technology. So access for every learner needing every component of everything that I just mentioned. And so while this is not a universal design for learning training, it is, I just want to take a few moments just to kind of point this out as we're talking about accessibility, creating our teacher created materials. So that essentially just quickly um, providing multiple means of engagement. So we're stimulating the interests and motivations for the learning. So engagement is not the same as entertainment, right? Engaging is actually engaging the learning, actively participating, whereas sometimes I think 
And that could be uh, when you you walk into a classroom. I remember um, I, I had a uh, I was co-teaching with a, a teacher and I was in special ed. She was a, a gen ed teacher. And this big day, we had all of these iPads and, and the gen ed teacher had these activities where they were um, doing this um, sort of like this quiz game. And so you had to quickly answer all of these questions. Then you earn these points. So the whole class was like screaming and like really super excited about it. And I remember the superintendent came by. I said, oh my gosh, those students are really engaged. And I said, well, let's look at that. <laughs> the students that I supported who had the special ed services um, that I was like the, the supports I was providing for them were just sitting passively. They were passively learning because the processing time, there was not the, the processing time wasn't available for them. So they were more entertained watching other students be engaged because that tool was not accessible for every single learner. It was for those who could process quickly, who had drag and drop features, who could really manipulate and was super proficient in the iPad. So just be thinking about that. The difference between engagement and entertaining can look very, very differently. And representation, so that's presenting our content in different ways. Like the cat video, I could have said, hey, Bruce, isn't it feeling like hurting cats? Like we're like sitting there joking around each other. He'd be like, yeah, Kelly, isn't that hilarious? But that video kind of gives it a different way to kind of talk about what I'm trying to convey. And then action and expression. That's just different ways that students can show what they know. And that's accessibility is key for us to truly get to know who our students are and for them to show what they know and who they are It. um thinking about those universal design principles. So I'm not gonna take a lot of time on this, but I want you to think about what accessible means to you. And if you would drop that in the chat box, that would be amazing. Um, what accessible means to you? And there's no wrong answer at all. So we're gonna collect all of those together and really reflect at the end what accessible means to you. And I know that we're here, we know we're talking about AIM, so that might give you a little bit more uh, advantage as far as what you might say as far as accessibility. But um, if you want to, please just think about the reflect if you want, or if you feel um, comfortable, I invite you to also put that in the chat box. So accessible according to the definition of the Office of Civil Rights. So this is the, the definition. So it, for accessibility, I'm gonna read this. Accessibility is shaped by what we do, our interactions with the environments and our personal preferences. So a person with a disability can acquire the same information, engage in the same interactions, enjoy the same services as a person without a disability in an equally effective, equally integrated manner with substantially equivalent ease of use. You may have seen this definition in this graphic probably a million times, and I hope you have. <laughs> I hope you have because it's really important thing to point out. Same information, same interactions, same services. It's not modifying um, anything. It's giving students an opportunity to engage, to get to the same goal, just how they're going to get there is differently. It's not, um, I love how someone tweeted out one time, accessibility is not extra steps, it's just the steps we missed. So um, another reason why I'm really thrilled that you're here uh, for this when Bruce starts diving in about how to create our content um, accessible. It's just steps we missed. And once we start practicing it, hopefully it just becomes second nature and you don't see anything else but um, every single learner, um, no matter. So we're not retrofitting, we're really creating um, from the start. I have to say this, some people think digital means accessible. So the contrary to common assumption, digital does not mean it's accessible. It just means it's available to our learners. And I see this a lot when, if I'm working with students with, um, let's just say specifically dyslexia, because I worked with a lot of students with dyslexia. And when I would work with my colleagues, what we had, and they would say, well, we have the, the textbooks, they're digital, so they can use text to speech. And I would say, yes, and they are digital, but the it's not accessible because the there's no alt text on the on the images. There's piece, pieces that are missing. It just means it's available. So to be truly accessible. So Bruce is going to give you some tips on um, instead of if you're scanning something on your copy machine and you're emailing it to yourself or you're you're giving PDFs for your students in um, in your learning management system and you can't <clears throat> students don't have the ability to adjust the font or if you try to highlight the font, you can't do that. 
your device, the student's device has no idea if there's a picture of an animal or there's text on there. So, and then they they can't use text to speech if that's the, the needed assistive technology that they need or a screen reader because it doesn't recognize the text. So digital does not mean it's accessible. It just means it's available for our students. So that goes into AIM. So thinking of AIM, just to, uh, again, I'm setting the groundwork for the, the second part of this is uh, just the definition of AIM is printed technology-based core educational materials that are designed to enhance in a way for usable across the widest range of learner variability, regardless of the format, okay? So any student who comes into your classroom, no matter if they just moved in the next day, so if you come in and your student has, let's just say dyslexia, he needs text-to-speech, you're not giving just a printed worksheet, you have the activity on a device where a student can actually use their text-to-speech. So in the widest range of learner variability, um, regardless, um, even including uh, students with disabilities. So what are AIM? I love this image. So AIM is essentially, it's the information that the learner is taking in. So regardless of uh, where or how they're learning. So for example, our textbooks, our eBooks, websites, it's the information that the students are able to gain so they can express what they know. Lack of knowledge does not mean lack of intelligence. So if a student can't access and gain that knowledge, they're never going to be able to show you what they know. So this is why AIM is so important for our students to be able to um, have so they can interact, they can decode, and they can respond to the activities and to the information that you're you're giving to your students. So then accessible format, friends, this is a kind of a high level definition. So I'm going to break it down for you. But so for the high level definition, Alternative manner or form that gives an eligible person access to the work when copy or phone accord and in the accessible format and use exclusively by an eligible person to permit him or him or her to have access to feasibly and comfortably as a person without such a disability. When I read that, I'm like, say what? So let's break that down and what accessible formats mean. So it's just the ways we access information, okay? We can have audio, we can have digital, we can have tactile graph graphics, braille. These are all different formats, but we can't have those formats unless what we've, what we've created from the start, from that static text can be adjusted. The font, the contrast color, all of these things that a student can uh, have control over and changing it to the way that they learn best, those are the formats. And so we, we have to think what format is the best for a student. So we can't assume just because a student is blind that they need braille. The student may need audio, they may need both, but if we've already created our content to be accessible, it's not gonna be a problem because we can automatically do it. We're not retrofitting. Again, we're prepared uh, for any students that's in our environment. And then some students need assistive technology. So when it comes to assistive technology, it's essentially any piece of equipment that allows us to improve functional capabilities um, if we have a, a disability, but so it becomes assistive technology when a, when a student needs that and is, is documented in their IEP. I'm going to break down what I mean by assistive technology and accessible technologies. There's there is a different there difference there, but if a student needs um, that accommodation, that will be assistive technology. Some examples of assistive technology. I have an image on the slides. Um, text to speech. We have speech to text. We have um, we can use word prediction. Um, all of these things are. Uh, we have a switch, a mouse, um, enlarging the font. All of these are different examples of assistive technology. So, assistive technology must integrate with the aim, or it's not going to work. And I'll break that down for you here in just a second. So accessible and assistive technologies. So when we talk about accessible technologies, Bruce is going to talk about built-in features of some technology. That's going to be the accessible technology. And that's really good for all. That's universally designed. Any individuals can access that and use text-to-speech or if you're if you're writing and you're you're multitasking and you're using a speech or dictation, you're using your voice, it's not really needed. It's just a choice that you have. And then it becomes assistive when it's individualized for that one learner. And then if it's assistive, it's about that need. The student needs that to improve the functional capability um, of that activity. And then when it's accessible, it's just a flexibility of choice. So again, the accessible is more of those built-in universal features. And then the assistive part to the right of the, the graph here, the yeah, the table is selected based on the feature that's needed by an individual. Okay. We think about the set framework. 
student environment task and tool. That's really going to think about the features of the assistive technologies that's needed for that student based on what the goal is for that student. Accessible is more proactive. Assistive is more responsive. If you have any questions about that, um, just pop it in the chat and I'll be happy um, to look and see if I can get that answered for you. So connecting that all together before I move on to Bruce, when we connect all of that with accessibility, so your aim and our technologies and strategies look to make the learning environment as flexible and as accommodating as possible. And then that assistive technology part looks to lower those barriers of an individual student who may face in whatever environment that they find themselves. Again, we have to have our content accessible in order for that to even work. And then both of those approaches strive to ensure full access, participation, and progress for the students. And I'm, and I'm going to show you how all of those things work together. To summarize this, the materials, that's the information, the content of the uh, of the curriculum, and then the technology must be accessible for the students for even to work with the materials and the system technology. All three of those pieces have to work together in order for full access for our learner. So materials, the technology, and the system technology. If number one, the aim does not work, the technology is not going to interact with that, and then the student cannot gain that knowledge that's needed on that particular assignment. So we want access from the start to the finish. And I have a gift here of hitting a, a, a door a button that automatically opens and it gets to the stairs. Okay. So this re reminds me of if you have something that's digital, but it's not accessible, how are students going to be able to decode the text if in fact the barrier is um, decoding? So, and they can't use text to speech. So access from start to finish. So we have to make sure that our, our students can get to and get through and get out. So we need to check for barriers. So this is where we we do accessibility checkers. I'm briefly gonna talk about this because Bruce may dive into it a little bit, but just know that when we use accessibility checkers, those will be more of the, um, like PowerPoint has built in accessibility checkers, that it really only flags about 30% of the errors. So we can't solely rely on the accessibility checkers. So we can do the automated, but we also do should do manual checking as well. And I'm just gonna exit out of um, this slide here. And I just wanna show you what I mean. For instance, um, my next slide is just run the checker. So we talked a little bit about uh, keyboard shortcuts, just for slides. Um, I just wanna show you if, a, if an individual is using a screen reader, the reading order is so important, right? We don't want, like here I have um, this uh, a title here. I wouldn't want the image to pop up first and then the page number and then the, the content of the text and then the title. This is going to be con completely confusing to our screen reader users. So we have to make sure that we want it in a, a format that we would typically want from, from one to 10. So just a quick check that I do in, um, you can do with the, your, is use your tab button just to check. If you don't have your accessibility checker, let's just say it's not working, you want to check the reading order. I'm simply hitting tab and it's went right there. So it goes to the title and then it goes to the content. It goes to my image and then it goes to my page number. So just a quick manual check if you want to use that keyboard shortcut to check for those barriers. That's an easy way to do it, especially when you use Google Slides because Google Slides, friends, does not have um, accessibility checker. Bruce may have some tips on that, friends, but Grackle's a tool to check for accessibility, but he'll have some other ways as well. And just really quick, I'm in PowerPoint, and if you want to check for accessibility of your slides in uh, Microsoft PowerPoint, I am going to go to review and click on check accessibility. So once I click on check accessibility, you're going to see here it's got some errors, all right? So when I choose number eight, um, it says I have eight area, uh, errors, which missing audio or video subtitles, which I have those embedded. So I know that that's accessible because I've already done a manual check. And then here you see I have a duplicate slide title. So um, if again, the duplicate slide titles, I don't want that for a screen reader because if a screen reader is going to go through and tab through, they won't, um, our AT user won't know exactly which slide that they need to go to. So that is the accessibility checker that you can go, but just be mindful that it's only will catch about 30% of the, um, 
the errors that are on there. Bruce, feel free to pipe pipe in there. So, um, okay, so just like uh, I have like one more minute here, accommodations versus modifications. Accessibility is going to allow our students to access the content. So if you have a junior in high school whose beginning reading level is first grade, but they're um, because decoding is the barrier, if they can comprehend at grade level or above, that student should have access to grade level curriculum. And that can happen when we're creating our content in, with accessibility in mind right out of the gate. So accommodations, this is where assistive technology, the accessible technologies um, are allowable to use and it doesn't change the curriculum. It only changes how the student's going to access and express their knowledge by using that. That's the accommodation. And then when we start modifying material because maybe a student has a learning disability and they need to use text-to-speech but for some reason they're not allowed to use it in their classroom or it's, it's not accessible to them, it's really lowering the expectation of that student's knowledge and their skills when in fact if they had that accommodation of the assistive technology as text-to-speech they can access that more independently so bruce today is really going to be focusing on the accommodations because we're going to be creating our content that's uh, accessible so to summarize accommodations look like this friend udl universal design for learning is that choice built into the environment our, our aim is the same content in an accessible format, which Bruce is going to dive into. And then the assistive or accessible technologies are just differing ways that our students are going to interact and respond to the same content. Okay. Prime example, last one, no blowing candles. Whoa. Young man's birthday. Oh my goodness. He's trying right to blow it there, out. Right there. Look. What are you? You're going to open your mouth and blow. Do it. <gasps> Trying to blow. <sighs> Tries. Hold on. And then dad's going to leave. Go down, daddy. Go down. He's going to come back. Okay. <laughs> with combination. Okay. Ready? Stop. Blow. Yay. There you go. Yay. Oh. <laughs> Good job, buddy. Now eat it. Now eat it. <laughs> so, friends, no more candle blowing. We're going to create our instruction that is um, where every student can blow out their own candle. A student, if they can comprehend and decoding is the barrier, if they can, if they need to use text to speech to engage and participate in their own learning, that's what we want to do. So, this vision, this. Uh, Right here, access for every learner. Um, some disabilities look like this. We may have an individual or a learner in a classroom with a cane who or is blind, uh, a learner in a wheelchair or crutches. All of a sudden, we're super accommodating, right? We see we see the disability. For, so for us, we think, oh, it's not even a question. Accessibility, of course. I need to set my move my environment. Of course, I need braille, large print, or you know, or whatever it is. But it's the individuals at the bottom. Some look like this. And it looks like what we would call a typical peer. But just because we can't see the disability doesn't mean it's less crucial for access to the content. And students shouldn't have to self-identify themselves. So when we have accessibility in mind, this is not even a question. Students have that choice to access it however they need. But we know it's not always obvious. So Bruce is getting ready to dive in now and show you ways to create it whether it's obvious or not, because they will have a choice on how they can interact and engage and respond to the content. Because we have visual, we have tactile, and we have auditory reading. Literacy is not just about visual, but it's audible and digital materials across any disciplines in any context. So are you ready, Bruce? You ready to empower our students? Okay, let's I'm, get I'm started, ready. friend. I'm gonna well, stop sharing. Thank you. Thank you very much, Kelly. I really enjoyed that. All right, let me get mine set up. And don't forget, uh, Deb, say the technology prayer for me. Please work. Amen. Okay. Right uh, with the amen, too. Did you say uh, amen? Amen, yes. So uh, first yes, off, I did. <laughs> uh, what I, what I want to point out is uh, one of the things that makes me feel really good about using chat GPT, it's one of the few intelligence is that spells worse than I did. So check out accessible. This was for whatever reason, it can't spell. But uh, so uh, as mentioned before, I'm Bruce Alter. I'm both a pediatric PT and an AT consultant. I'm also part of the AIM cohort, which we talked about. And I've, uh, that's how I got to know Kelly. 
And what I would say is being involved with CAST and the cohort really opened my eyes to the importance of accessible educational materials and how they are inseparable from assistive technology. I didn't used to see them that way. So the two QR codes are for some resource documents. You should already have some links to them, but I'm leaving them up here just in case. During this session of the presentation, I'm going to focus on how to make teacher-generated materials more accessible for students. And this is of vital importance. I'm finding that teachers are using fewer and fewer textbooks and more and more materials that they pull from websites, purchased from teacher pay teachers, or put together from an assortment of books. This means that simply getting a student an accessible textbook from Bookshare, which used to be good enough, is probably useless because the students may not be using that book in class. Please keep in mind that teacher-generated materials are not just documents. As was mentioned before, they include videos, lectures, what they display or project in their classes. Although these are typically not considered AIM, they really should be, uh, as discussed, and I certainly think of them that way. So I'm going to discuss making them accessible as well. But the bottom line, the goal is to ensure that the materials that teachers create and use in their class are as accessible as possible to more of their students, and this will build on some of the foundational information that Kelly just presented. So we, the word retrofitting was used earlier. It's always easier to make something accessible from the start rather than having to go back and correct it. I've done a number of presentations now for the Savas Learning Company, a major curriculum company, and my push has always been make it accessible from the start and not complain about how difficult it is after you've already done the curriculum. By making it accessible from the start, you ensure that the materials you create are as accessible as possible for all students. So one easy way to ensure that the documents you create are accessible is to create a template with the correct font size, headings, and all the other options set up. By starting each document from the template, you will have already done many things needed to make the document accessible. And in the resources, I've got a handout that gets step-by-step -step instructions on how to do this. And although it's pretty detailed, it is easy to follow, and you only need to do it once to create a Google or an MS Word doc that you can use as a template for future documents. So in the interest of time, I'm not gonna go through and show how to do all this, but the handout will walk you through it step by step. Now, Google Docs, we're all, we're all slaves to Google. Google Docs does not actually have a template. I don't know why, maybe they will next week, but they don't now. However, an easy workaround is save the Google Doc with a unique name so you remember to duplicate it before you open it and overwrite it. On my docs, I put make copy before using next to the name. And then I also stash two or three other copies in a folder saying uh, duplicate before using. So that way I can always go back to my base document rather than have, having to recreate it. Now, unlike Google Docs, Microsoft Word does have an actual template function. And the instructions for saving the document as a template are in the handout. And because it's a template, a fresh copy is made each time you open it. And you'll also see there's some uh, basic instructions on using the built-in Word accessibility checker. And what Kelly said is really, I, I think there's two parts to this. Sometimes it's not going to show you all the accessibility problems. None of the automatic ones will, but also may show you so much information that you're snowed under and you don't find some of the bigger pieces. And I'll talk about that in a bit. Ensuring that teacher-generated materials work well with screen readers means that students with vision impairment or blindness will be able to use them. So a screen reader, unlike standard text-to-speech, will read everything on the computer screen or iPad. And this includes not only text, but also controls, what Kelly was talking about, about the tab order, the order that uh, controls are on the page. This really shows up in the screen reader. So this way, a student who can't see the screen can still interact with it. And I think it's completely remarkable that Apple built screen readers into their iOS devices because it allows a student who's completely blind to effectively use what's basically a sheet of glass. One thing we wanted to cover today is how to check apps for accessibility. This would require an entire session, but I'll give you the simplest way possible in what I actually do. Usually before I recommend an app, the first test I'll do is I'll try to use it with a screen reader. And this is the quickest way to expose if there's accessibility issues. Now, if it works well with a screen reader, then I can dig in deeper and see if it meets other uh, WCAG standards. That's Web Content Accessibility guide, Guidelines. 
But if it fails the screen reader test right off the bat, I know it won't be usable for all our students and it will probably have other accessibility issues the developer didn't think of. Primarily, we think about blind students using Braille, but this is becoming much less common due to availability screen readers for just about every device. And I'm not saying Braille isn't important, so don't tell Michael Cantino that I said Braille is not, I'm not saying that. What I am saying is that students are using it less and all the uh, vision specialists that I speak to tell me the same thing. Today, someone who's blind can use iPad, iPhone, Apple Watch, Android phone, Chromebook, and any PC or Mac. Some of these devices have built-in comprehensive screen readers, or you can purchase applications like JAWS for the PC, or there's an open source NVDA that also runs on the PC. So here's an example of how VoiceOver, a screen reader for Mac and iOS works with uh, text and uh, with images and alt text, and I'm going to be talking about alt text next. So first, you're going to see me turn on VoiceOver, and then once it starts, it's going to orient me to which application it's on. And when I swipe right with a single finger, it's going to advance to the next uh, control or text. And when it reaches text, it starts talking. So I had to leave to, uh, because I was having network issues. So hopefully, I have my sound set up right. If you uh, don't hear any sound, let me know. VoiceOver on, Safari, landscape, forward, page settings, selected, address, puzzle piece extension, button, go to drive, button, demo of all text for Sava's presentation, edit, button, once in the lush jungles of a faraway land, there lived a red-headed monkey named Rufus, a red-headed monkey giving a check to a cat, kitten and a bunny, all of them are happy, image, so this, this, is, this is how a screen reader, along with alt text, allows a visually impaired or blind user to read a document that has pictures or diagrams. A great deal of teacher-generated material has images on it, but there's an easy way to ensure that your students using screen readers can access these images. By adding alternative or alt uh, descriptions of the images, all students will understand what it shows. And your typical student, even though he's using text-to-speech, will not see or hear the alt text. So it's not going to clutter up the page for them. So it's easy to add alt text to your documents. I'm going to show you how. When you create content for your students to read, you should make sure if you use images, you include alternative text. Alternative text, usually known as alt text, is a description of the image. It's used by students who are blind or visually impaired when they have a screen reader running so they know that there is an image and what's in it. I'm going to show how to add alt text to Google Slide and also to a Google Doc. And then I'll show how it sounds when you use a screen reader on my tab. So I've added an image to a Google Slide. I'm going to select it and then right click and you'll notice when I do that, there's a place here for alt text. So the title might be something like my cat. But the description is where you'd want to really put some effort. It should be descriptive, but not too wordy. So orange cat, um, orange blanket. If an image is going to require a great deal of description, like it's a complicated graph, there are other ways to do it that make a lot more sense, and you may want to include a complete description of it in the text you're using. If an image is strictly decorative, you don't need to provide alt text. So I'm going to click OK. And if I was in a Google Doc, it would be exactly the same thing. So here I'm in an untitled doc. I'm going to right click a little further down as alt text, and I would add uh, probably a pizza and then a description. In the description, don't use like picture of or illustration of. There's no reason for that. Uh, um, I'm not sure what the type of pizza this is at this point. I'm just going to cancel out. All right, now let me show you how this will look on or how it will sound on an iPad running voiceover, which is its screen reader technology. Okay, I've got the Google Slide app open on my iPad and I have voiceover turned on. I'm going to select the image. Alt 
I hope you consider adding alt text whenever you're adding pictures to your Google Doc or Google Slides that you plan to use with your students. It doesn't take much work to do and it makes the document or slides accessible to everyone. And now for some reason, I think I want some lunch. So, sorry about the attempt at humor. You know, when we talk about making things accessible first, the point is if you get in a habit of whenever you're putting an image, you, it's not that you should think, well, do I have a blind kid in my class? It's just you add alt text. And then if you do that, when the time comes where you have a vision impaired or blind student in your class, you won't have to suddenly start a new workflow. You'll be building off a really good habit. So teacher generated material doesn't only include print. Many teachers use video. However, this poses an issue for students who are deaf or hard of hearing. Closed captions allow those students to understand what's being spoken in videos. And you saw an example how Kelly uses that uh, in pretty much every presentation I've ever been at. She's very conscientious about it. The best closed captions are those added by hand, but the time required to do this is much more than people have available. Thankfully, YouTube automatically adds closed captions to any videos you upload. And this video shows you how to use them and also an additional setting that you may not be aware of. Whenever you upload a video to YouTube, it has automatic closed caption. And you'll see this show up usually within an hour of when you upload it. So if I click on this, I can turn on closed captions and you'll see that here, but there's some additional settings that can be helpful. If you go under settings and then under subtitles, you'll notice uh, it's set for English, but there's also an option to auto translate. And there's a wide variety of languages you can auto translate in. So closed captioning can be very helpful for students who are deaf and hard of hearing, or they can be helpful for students that uh, where English is not their native language and you want to provide them with some additional support so they can understand the dialogue. I hope you find this helpful. For some of the highest quality closed caption videos and those with full descriptions and for, for people who are blind so that completely describes what's going on, there is the, and this is a mouthful, described and captioned media program, thankfully abbreviated to DCMP. So this is a free service if you're an educator with students who need closed captions described or videos that have ASL interpretation or American Sign Language interpretation. They have many videos and you can actually choose to how you're going to have them display information to help your student with vision or hearing impairment. The only thing I found about them that's really annoying is that whenever you access a video, you have to fill out a questionnaire indicating how you use it. And I think that's essential for their funding. So in this video, I'm going to show how some of the different settings on the bottom left, it says language accessibility, how that works, and also what ASL looks like in a video that has that option. Do you have a family? I bet you do. I bet your family has many grandparents, aunts and uncles, brothers and sisters, mom and dad. Maybe you have step-parents, step-siblings, step-grandparents. Maybe you live with your aunt and uncle. Maybe you live with foster family. There's so many different types of families. Well, today we're going to um, So not all their videos have ASL, but for those who do, you'll notice you're able to move the ASL window uh, to wherever you think it works best for that particular video. So in the in the resources, I have a link to that, and you can sign up for a free account, uh, or your teacher, teachers can sign up for it. Typically, when we're talking about accessible materials, we mean curriculum books, documents, we just talked about videos. But consider that much of what takes place in a classroom is the teacher talking. What if a student is deaf or hard of hearing or just needs a little more information to understand what the teacher is saying? Because of this need, I'm going to show <clears throat> two easy ways to get live captioning in the classroom without having any special equipment and making it so the live captioning is available for the students who need it. Now, of course, it, it is possible to do live captioning of presentations at the front of the classroom, but this is a way to get it personalized. So iOS has an accessibility feature called live captions. If you open settings, accessibility, and you look under the hearing section, you'll see it. Let me show you what it looks like in practice. And I, I had to do this with a handheld camera because of the way it displays on the screen. I couldn't use my uh, normal video tools. 
this is a demonstration of live caption. Mm -hmm. It's intended to display text of what someone is saying. You can imagine this would be very helpful for a student who is deaf or hard of hearing so that they could <clears throat> see what the teacher is saying. And if the teacher was wearing a pair of Bluetooth earbuds that had a microphone, the quality would be even better because it could broadcast directly to this. So another way to provide live captions and instantaneous translation is by using Microsoft Translator, something I hadn't heard of until a couple of weeks ago, and I've since used at least um, used with a class my wife was teaching. You can use it when both people are in the same room or when they're on the other side of the world. Let me show you how this works. It's a pretty cool program. Microsoft Translator is an app that runs on iOS, Android, or you can access it through a browser on a Windows computer. It's particularly handy if you are working with a student who would need support in their native language, say during a lecture. Or perhaps you have a student who is deaf and hard of hearing and they speak English, but it would be helpful for them if they had a live transcript of what was taking place during a lecture. So I'm displaying my iPad screen. I'm actually using the app on my iPad and an app on my iPhone. I'm going to be transmitting the conversation from my iPhone, but it's a two-way um, street with this, so you could actually hold a conversation back and forth with translation as needed. So let me first start. Um, you'll see down here is a code, so let me put in and, and actually, the code I need is the one above it. It's using Bluetooth, and it picked up that my phone was already on a, on a uh, conversation. And I'm going to turn off the speaker. You'll notice I have the microphone turned off, so I'm going to initiate this from my phone. So I'm going to turn on the microphone. And what you'll see is that as I'm speaking, the text is on the screen and I have it set for English. So this would be a use case where you have a student who maybe needs additional support because of a hearing issue. And this would give them live text during a lecture. All the teacher would have to do is set up a device, maybe use a remote Bluetooth microphone if necessary, and then share the code with the student who could run this on their device. Now let me show you how you can do translation. I'm going to switch to Spanish. Let me turn off my mic. So I'm going to uh, go back and then I'm going to go into settings. And as you scroll down with settings, you'll see that there is a language. So I'm going to change this now, although I have to say it's pretty cool to see it in Japanese. We probably have a lot more kids that speak Spanish. So let's look for Mexican version of Spanish. So I've selected that. I'm going to go back. I'm going to uh, join the conversation again. And now let me turn on the mic. And I'll turn off the speaker. And so now when I'm speaking in English, it's displaying a simultaneous translation in Spanish. Now, of course, there are always limits with how accurate this is, but people who do speak uh, this language, Spanish, and I've also checked the Japanese one because we were using it in a class, told us that it's pretty darn good. So again, this is a free app you download from the App Store, Microsoft Translator, or you run in a browser on a Windows computer. And all you need to do to use it is start it up and make sure that you provide the code uh, that it generates so that the two um, devices are linked. I think there will be a lot of uses for this, and I hope people explore and try it with their students. It's pretty cool. It was mentioned at an OTAP meeting, and I started playing with it, and the uh, possibilities for teaching remotely, too, are, are, are quite extensive. If you have a student in your class with low vision, they may be using screen magnification tools such as Zoom on the iPad or Chromebook to make it easier for them to see what's on the screen. But how well can they see what you're projecting in class? So when we think about accessible materials, what is shown to the class on a video display or projection system is often not considered. 
But these systems are almost ubiquitous in our modern classroom, so let's ensure that materials that are displayed this way are accessible to all students. In the past, some students would use a device called an Acrobat. I don't know how many of you have seen them. It was basically a video camera and a display. They were extremely bulky. You had to get one for each classroom because you couldn't move them. But now you can do something very similar using a tool you're already good at using. In fact, a tool we're using right now and that's screen sharing in Zoom or Google Meet. Let me show you how. You may have a student in your class who is using magnification when they need to look at documents and they're quite skilled at doing it on their device. But what happens when you are showing stuff on the display or projection system in your room? Well, an easy way to provide it to them so that they can use their magnification tools is simply to use a tool you're already familiar with and that's Zoom or Google Meet. If you start a Zoom or Google Meet, share the link with that individual student then you can use the screen sharing feature to display, let's say, a document that you are using in your class. And what the student will see on their device is what's on your display. But now, since it's on their device, they can use Zoom or any of the other accessibility features they're already comfortable with so they can see it. All right, so this doesn't require purchasing anything or even learning to use a new tool. Just use what you already know to help those students. I hope you find this helpful. And, and once I've shown teachers how to do this, they get it immediately. They're already, they have their classroom computer. It's hooked up to their projection or their display. All they have to do is the additional step of starting a Google Meet. And the one or two kids, usually it's one kid in the class who needs to be able to use a Zoom function, can then join that meeting just like I showed. So I want to talk a bit about issues with math and teacher generated content and also sometimes in electronic textbooks, because this was actually from a presentation I did to Savas on some of their own accessibility issues. Many times the curriculum will use an image of an equation. So this is OK for students who can see. But for those using a screen reader, they either won't hear the equation or if it's in standard text, it may not make much sense. So I'm gonna run a voiceover. Take a look at the square root of two symbol. There's two of them up on that page and listen as the screen reader reads the page. Six for any square, the length of a diagonal is or 1.414 times one of the sides. The resultant is times one of the vectors. For example, the result. So notice that the square root of two is not read aloud and that's because it's an image. And so a screen reader would completely skip over it. Now there is a solution for that and that's to use a special type of language called MathML. MathML is a markup language that tells screen readers how to read math aloud. Like all text, it's invisible, but the screen readers will speak it. And if you think about it, when we look at a web page, we don't see all the tags and the markup language that tell the browser how to display it. We just see the content. MathML works exactly the same way. When properly used, it'll display the equation so it looks as expected, and the screen reader user will hear the equation read correctly. It's like a universal language for math. And by using it in teacher-generated content, such as a worksheet that a math teacher might create, we ensure everyone can access the mathematical expressions. So let's use the quadratic formula as an example, and this is what it looks like in MathML. And don't worry, there are uh, authoring tools that will generate this for you. And also, thankfully, this is not what anyone will see on the page. So what they will see instead is this. So, but unlike the image of a quadratic equation, this one is read correctly by a screen reader. X equals numerator minus B plus or minus square root of B squared minus 4AC and square root and numerator over 2A. So this is another example of improving accessibility for all students. Yes, it takes more work and you have to ensure the authoring tools you use in generate MathML, but the benefit is more students will be able to use the math sheets you create. And what drove me to learning about MathML was exactly a situation like this. We had a blind student in a class the teacher was projecting stuff. He had cut and pasted images of equations that he'd picked up off the internet. And the vision specialist was frantically trying to convert them on the fly so the student knew what was going on in the class. So I taught the teacher to use MathML. In the case, uh, in his case, in Word, he was using a thing called MathType. And from that point forward, all the worksheets and things he generated were accessible right from the start. 
So there's two different tools you can use for creating MathML. I have a video, but I'm not going to show it in the interest of time. There's, I don't know if I, I still don't know if I pronounce it right, Equatio by Texthelp. Did I get it? Okay, I've worked, thank you. I've been working on it. It's a really easy to use equation editor. You can even dictate the math. I show that in the video. And it creates MathML that you can drop into Google Docs or Word. It used to be free for teachers. I went and checked and no longer. They give you a free 30-day trial, but it's $160 a month for a single license. But consider how beneficial it would be for the math teachers in a district, especially at the high school level, to have a tool like this available and learn to use it. So the video where I show how to use um, uh, Equatio is in uh, the references. And finally, since of course I have to somehow work artificial intelligence into any presentation I do now, you can actually use generative AI to check the accessibility of a PDF or other document. For those of you that are real gearheads, I have a demonstration where I checked a VPAT and asked uh, the generative AI not only to check the VPAT, but put it in languages that a curriculum committee could easily understand and also generate a letter to the publisher explaining what faults there were according to the VPAT and when they needed to have them fixed. So if people are interested in seeing that, <laughs> I'll, 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 I can see. Yes, I'll show it to you. So if you have the paid version of ChatGPT Plus or Microsoft Copilot, you can actually upload a PDF and have the AI check it. But even if you don't have the paid version, uh, those two tools that I mentioned, and I think Claude and some others will let you upload a screenshot, so an image. So the prompt I use, sometimes I'll say like, you're an expert in accessibility or something like that, or you're an expert in WCAG standards. So the prompt, please check this PDF or image. And I tried both for accessibility using the WCAG 2.1 standards. Those are the, the guidelines that we use for determining accessibility of electronic materials. And please provide me with a table indicating any issues I need to fix. Well, why a table? Well, why not? I mean, we're not AI. What we need is to see information organized in a way that's easy for us to understand and use. And so by doing that, what I ended up with is this. So I didn't tell it to structure the table in a certain way. It's AI. It knows that. What I asked is to what was in the original prompt. So notice it gives me the WCAG references if I need to dig into it. But more importantly, it describes potential issues with the document and it gives me suggestions as how, as how to fix it. As Kelly mentioned, uh, and I think I've mentioned too, there are a number of tools you can use to check accessibility. But sometimes when you do them, you just see this pile up, this massive screen of stuff. And if you're not intimately familiar with the standards, it's just overwhelming. So something like this is not going to tell you everything. But if you have a, a PDF and you want to know what things you need to fix before you start using it, this can be a really simple way of doing it. And with that, uh, Kelly and I want to both thank you very much for your time and attention. And at this point, I'm going to stop screen sharing and see if there's any questions. Bruce, there, this is Kelly. There was a question in the chat um, when you were showing Microsoft Translator. Um, have you used it in um, on a Chromebook? I know I have, but do you have experience on a Chromebook? Well, so... There's two ways to use it on Chrome. And I think the easiest is if you have your, if you have a newer Chromebook and you can use Android apps on it, you can actually download the Android version of Translator. What, it, what have you done with it, Kelly? Yes, I've used it on a Chromebook and it's been fine. I've used it on Android devices and yeah, it's worked really well. One thing about that is have you, has anyone ever used, so we're talking about captions and translation, the PowerPoint Live um, translation. Um, yeah, I just, just for, I'm just going to show you what, um, I've done here. If you ever want to try it, um, I'm in PowerPoint now. If you go to present live automatically, a QR code pops up and you're welcome to try this now. I'll put this in the chat box. So if you, you can go to join the session at ppt.ms backslash K M U R Y E E four. And then if you join that, you can select the language that you would like it to be translated to during our um, our presentation. You also have the slides as well. So then I'll just go through here. 
and then my slide should be turning on yours and then it should be um, translating on your device as well. So just another option for translation. Great, thank you. I, I hope I wasn't going too far afield, but when you think about what takes place in the modern classroom, you walk into any classroom, they're gonna be using a projection system, they're gonna be displaying stuff. They may have a smart board that they're using as well. And that's where I found a lot of gaps in providing material. You know, sometimes we'll make progress in, in having a, a teacher consider putting all text in, but what happens if a kid needs magnification, et cetera. So that's why I went in these directions. And I hope that's useful or at least interesting to folks. Yes, Bruce, I loved when you were talking about alt text, you were putting in the title and the description. Um, just to kind of add on that, and correct me if I'm wrong, Bruce, the description is more important than the title because if you take the image and you put it somewhere else, it keeps the alt text. So if you save it as a PDF, the title doesn't stay there. And so I know when I first started and thinking about accessibility, I was just putting the, the description in the title and that was wrong. So then when I changed the format, the alt, that didn't go with that image. So um, to, without having to recreate the work and when you're putting it into a different format, make sure you're putting the description, the alt text in the description and not just that title. And let me amplify it a little bit more. I mean, writing good alt text is an art and there's a bunch of authoring tools, AI authoring tools that are out there now. But the thing that, that I see over and over again is someone will put a caption and they'll put the same caption in the alt text. And it's incredibly annoying if you're using a screen reader because you hear the caption read as the alt text, then you hear the caption read as, the, as it proceeds down. Um, there... If you're dealing with graphs, and I mentioned other more complicated, there are other ways to put in descriptive text. It's pretty complicated. I didn't do a demo of it. But the easiest thing is if it is a complicated graph, is put information, describe it in the actual text that everybody sees. So don't just throw a graph up and then move on. Describe what is in the graph. So that way a kid using a screen reader, as well as the students who may not be up as at the same level with understanding the content will have a fighting chance of knowing what it is. I so, love her, you uh, brought up, nope. Good, Go uh, Kelly Fodder's here with us today and she's written into the chat, if you have access to the ATIA 2024 recorded presentations, there was a good presentation from the Google team on accessibility features. Um, I, you know, I have just kind of a, a, a big general question, if you don't mind. I want to know how you help teachers get started with accessibility. What, what are the, what's the hook? What's the thing? I, I hear you saying, yeah, it's really important to, to start with accessibility and as you're creating your materials, but what would make me want to do that? What are the strategies you use? So the, the first strategy is I get the most buy-in if the teacher comes to me with a problem. If I go to the teacher and say, you've got a problem, I guess that's a little <laughs> all the way, but, but if the teacher comes to me and says, I have a blind student in my class and they're, I'm using, I'm using uh, these display tools and they're not able to get any of it. I'm trying to think one of one of the peach. What am I trying to think of? Anyway, there's there's a number of tools that kind of uh, jazz up Google Slides, but they create tremendous accessibility mm -hmm. issues. Why am I not remembering the name of it? Anyway, we'll later. So number one, if the teacher is the one that identifies the issue, then they want to have a problem. And the reason why I make so many videos is because if I can do a two minute video that shows the teacher, then we don't have to try to set up a meeting and get together and I can do follow up uh, electronically or asynchronously. Sometimes you just have to, you have to come up to a teacher and tell them there's, I've gotten a, uh, information from uh, students learning specialists that they're not able to access this content or, but I'll tell you the one that's the biggest problem for me and I would love a solution. And that's, I can explain 
in levels of technical detail or not, why a student with a decoding problem would benefit from audio reading support. It seems pretty straightforward to me. I'm getting fewer of the that really isn't reading arguments back. But what I get is, well, it's only a couple of paragraphs or there's only two test questions. And, and speaking of someone with dyslexia, people really don't understand it unless, maybe they don't understand it unless you experience it, but that's the one where I really have to watch my my temper. I think because the more I've done this, the more impatient I get with it. What I have tried to do, I have a couple of things I put together. So I have one, I have a document called After the UPAR, Now What? So the Universal Protocol for Accommodations Reading. After, when... When people see, I mean, if you can get that for your district, when people see mm -hmm. that graph, that this student is at grade level in the green and they're in the red two levels down when uh, they don't have audio support, that really shows them something. So I try to build on that by explaining that this isn't like, okay, and then we do book share and we're done. I try. That's where I really get into accessibility. So I have uh, some documents on how creating accessible documents for teachers, some of which what I did today is going to get pushed into that. Um, but I also uh, try to help them understand that accessibility means everything that the student is going to be presented with in print or electronically and how to use those tools. And I try to have meetings with all the teachers that are there because they'll often solve their own problems. So they'll, I'll have one teacher say, well, it's not really reading and the other teachers are like, that's crazy. He just needs to get whatever he's going to do to be successful. And I can just sit back and let him <laughs> go at each other. It's a little healthier. Did I answer your question, Gail? <laughs> yeah, that's, that's a great summary. I just think that um, it's so important to think about that also mm -hmm. from the beginning. When I think about accessibility from the beginning, but yeah. I'm a teacher by training and I if we aren't including them in this conversation mm -hmm. early on, they're not going to be doing it. And that that's yeah. where the barriers happen, which is, by the way, my session for next time. So I'll save the rest of that. <laughs> yes. That philosophy. Yeah. But thank you for thinking about it. Kelly, did you have a response? I was just going to say that um, I, I often have a conversation about, because oftentimes when we think about um, like, a assistive technology is cheating, right? So I always think about if it's a math test. So there's there's two things happening first before a student can actually um, get to the be tested on the content of the math. First is a test of accessibility or engagement. Can the student hold the pencil? Does the student have their glasses? And then it's a test of reading. So every single test and assessment that we're giving our students is a test of reading. So if they can't decode those directions to the math test with their assistive technology, they're never really going to be able to show you what they know. And I, and I also shared this story from our beloved colleague, Joy Zabala in the field, who was a huge mentor of mine. I adored everything about her. And she always shared the book club story about if I was, if we were all in a book club, like right now we came here to be in a book club to talk about the first chapter of the book. And you all had your hardback books and I was rolling in and I was running late and I read the audio book all the way there. And I walked into the book club and you are all holding. And the Bruce says, Kelly, where's your book? And I was said, oh, I read the audio book. I mean, is he going to look at me and say, oh, that's cheating. We all read the book and you listen to it. That's that's not fair. But it really comes down about what are we assessing? If I can have a conversation about what I just read, that's what matters. So it's, it's thinking about the assessment, if it's a fair assessment and when those accommodations come into play. So I think testing sometimes becomes a barrier, especially state testing, where accessibility is not, we're, we're worried that, oh, they can't use these accommodations on the state testing and all of those things that um, we have, like, what are we actually testing and, and why does that matter? So just throwing that out there. 